Someone asked me the other day why the paint on my cowl looks so faded. Well, it's not the paint that's faded, it's a coating of lead. Airplanes really are the last vestige of internal combustion engine that requires leaded fuel. So what makes the blue stuff so special? Do we really need it? Why is it so expensive? And why are we expecting that price to increase even further, even beyond the current gas price spikes? To understand why airplane gas, or more commonly 100 low lead is so expensive, we need to take a step back and talk about how an auto cycle internal combustion engine works. There are a total of four strokes. The engine first sucks in a fuel air mixture, the intake valves then closes, and the piston squeezes that mixture together. The spark plug fires, causing the mixture to ignite, forcing the piston back down. Finally, the exhaust valve opens and the piston blows the burnt air mixture out. For our purposes, we're only going to focus on the squeeze and bang strokes. At the top of the cycle, or where the volume is minimal, we call this the top dead center. At the bottom, where the piston has the most volume, we call this bottom dead center. The difference in volume between the piston in top dead center and bottom dead center is called the compression ratio. Engines get a lot of extra efficiency if they have a higher compression ratio. That is to say, for the same amount of fuel, you can get a lot more power. Most aircraft have very low compression ratios in the range of seven or eight and a half to one. My IL360 is 8.7 to one, for example. The average car has a ratio of around eight or 10 to one. My SUV, which is more high performance, has a ratio of about 11 to one. Race cars are often in the range of 12 to one or higher. But then why don't all engines have a high compression ratio? The extra heat and strength are part of the problem, but the biggest issue comes from the fuel. At higher compressions, the fuel air mixture can spontaneously combust, causing detonation or worse, pre-ignition. We call this knocking due to the characteristic sound it makes. This is when the bang happens before the spark plug ignites the fuel air mixture. The force acting in the opposite direction of rotation is really, really bad. It can cause an engine to destroy itself or even stop the engine entirely. To understand how fuel plays a factor, we need to talk about the octane ratings. It's defined as a ratio between octane and heptane that would provide a certain resistance to knocking. The higher the octane number, the more resistant it is to detonation. But if you've ever been to a racetrack, you'll see they run 130 octane fuel. How can you have 130% octane? That's where additives come in. You can make fuel have the equivalent knock resistance to higher octane fuel by adding fuel additives. The additive we use in aviation gas is called lead specifically tetraethyl lead. To get 100 low lead gas, we take 94 octane gas and add TEL. This is the same lead that was banned in car fuel and is why we see labels on vehicles to use unleaded gasoline only. Lead is quite toxic and has been directly linked to health issues, especially cognitive decline, which may explain the popularity of certain aircraft types. But did you notice something strange? I said we needed a high octane fuel to prevent knocking in high compression engines. I also said that cars have higher compression than airplanes but cars run a much lower octane, often around 87 to 91 octane. As it turns out, we use leaded gasoline for reasons other than its octane rating. There's a lot of myths when it comes to these reasons, and I've heard some really strange ones. The craziest I heard was that we need lead and gasoline to help lubricate the engine. I've no idea where this one came from, but interestingly, the converse is true. Lead and gasoline doesn't mix well with synthetic oils, so we're forced to use more conventional or semi-synthetic oils. Those conventional oils require more frequent oil changes as they break down a lot faster. Eliminate lead and you can use modern synthetic oils. That would add life to an engine and generally mean less oil changes, even if they are more expensive. Another reason I've heard is that ethanol is in some car gas and that it will totally ruin the fuel system. This does have a kernel of truth. Fuel lines from 50 years ago would not work well with ethanol, except you should be replacing your fuel lines a lot more often than once every 50 years. My plane uses hard lines, for instance, which aren't susceptible to this. Fuel pumps and fuel distribution blocks can easily be replaced with parts that aren't affected by blended gas. And all that ignores that you can buy car gas that doesn't include any ethanol. But there is two good reasons that we use the blue stuff. The first is standardization. Car gas changes by manufacturer and even by season. Did you know fuel producers add butane to gas to boost octane ratings in the winter? That's why winter gas is cheaper. It's not all about price gouging, mostly. The second reason is a lot more interesting. When a liquid reaches a certain temperature or low pressure, it starts to boil. If that fuel boils in a fuel line, it can get trapped and prevent the liquid from flowing freely, causing vapor lock. Testing has demonstrated that the boiling temperatures and pressures of car gas is a lot sooner and at a lot lower altitudes than 100 low lead av gas. This means that on a hot day, and especially higher altitudes, you can experience vapor lock in the fuel lines or even boiling fuel in the gas tanks. So what's the future for aviation gasoline? Last year, GAMI was awarded an STC using their 100 unleaded gasoline in Cessna 172s, one of the most popular planes in the United States, and are expecting to add more types in the future. This fuel is designed to alleviate the vapor lock issues. The catch is that this fuel is expected to cost about $1 a gallon more than 100 low lead. Based on current fuel costs, 100 low lead is about 40% more expensive than car gas. 
If you're forced to buy 100 unleaded, you'll be paying around 60% more per gallon. But there's another competitor, and it has been around for a while. It's called Unleaded 91, and as its name implies, it's a 91 octane unleaded gasoline. It has been around for more than a decade at this point, and it is approved by the EASA, the European equivalent of the FAA. For most aircraft, certainly my airplane, this fuel is more than adequate. It provides ample detonation margins and is regulated to a higher standard that should alleviate any of the vapor lock issues. Unfortunately, UL 91 isn't available in North America, and there seems to be little to no effort from the governing bodies to permit it. One of the best parts of UL 91 is that it's cheaper than 100 low lead, although not significantly so. So why not both? Why can't we have 100 unleaded for engines that need it and 91 octane for everyone else? The best reason I can find is that the government feels the market isn't big enough. While that may be true, it's also a question for the market to answer, not for the government to impose on us. I know when I'm flying cross country and I'm given the choice to save a few cents per liter by using a different airport, I do, and so do many of my friends. If you've ever changed your flight plans around gas prices, leave me a comment below. You may be asking, what about electric airplanes? Their engines are tiny and produce dramatically more power. Unfortunately, their energy density isn't there yet. You'd struggle to get an hour or more of flight time from them. Companies like Pipistrol have options, but they're more suited for flight training where the aircraft doesn't leave the airport. For private owners like myself, it's unfortunately a non-starter. So that's the lowdown on why Avgas is so expensive. As with many skyrocketing prices in aviation, it's regulatory. If they decide to permit something new like UL91 and there's any problem, then there will be a mob at the door angry that they made that choice. If they keep dragging their feet and denying new, cheap, unleaded alternatives, they'll just keep slowly strangling the general aviation industry, and they won't be around to answer for that. For the rundown of an accident caused by a plane that doesn't use gas at all, you can click over here. And until next time, fly safe.